So this is the second talk in the Rethinking Existentialism series, um, and this one is on Albert Camus. Camus was a, a good friend of, of Sartre and Beauvoir uh, during the war, um, well, from about 1943 onwards, um, and in the years after the war uh, in Paris. Um, he was a philosopher, uh, a novelist, uh, a playwright, um, a journalist, uh, and a political theorist. Um, and he's often classified as an existentialist. Uh, but I think this is a mistake. I don't think he is an existentialist. Um, and I think that classifying him that way misrepresents him uh, and misrepresents existentialism too. Uh, so that's what this talk is going to be about. Um, and there's no better place to start, I think, than in the autumn of 1945, in the time that uh, Simone de Beauvoir later described in her um, autobiography as the existentialist offensive. So I think I, I mentioned in the in the first talk that um, after the war, um, Sartre and Beauvoir uh, published a number of papers, uh, a number of uh, popular articles. They published uh, the Sartre published two novels. They launched a journal, Les Temps Modernes, uh, and they gave public talks. And they generally tried to. Uh, promote their philosophy under the brand name of existentialism um, as, a, uh, as a major kind of cultural influence on the rebuilding of, of French politics and French culture um, after the end of the Second World War. And it's during that time that uh, Albert Camus was being interviewed by a newspaper uh, and the interviewer asked him a question that interviewers were asking a lot of people at the time. Uh, are you an existentialist? Uh, to which Camus replied, no, no, I'm not an existentialist. He said, um, Sartre and I hold no uh, things in common and uh, are not responsible for one another's deaths. And this is often taken as a kind of slightly light-hearted brush off, you know, perhaps because, you know, any good existentialist would reject the label because, you know, existentialists don't like labels or something. Um, sometimes a, a slightly smarter um, a version of that point is made, which is that, you know, Sartre and Beauvoir at the time were becoming quite a phenomenon. And if Camus had allowed himself to be co-opted into their project, as it were, um, then he would have uh, been unable to really establish his own voice uh, and his own presence um, as an intellectual, as a writer and, and so on. Um, uh, so rather than be sort of ushered into their shadow, as, it, as you might put it, he, um, he resisted the label for that reason. And I think there's something to be said for that uh, point. But I also think that there's a deeper philosophical reason why he reject, rejected the label, which is that he's right. He's not an existentialist. In fact, um, his own philosophy that was already uh, being published uh, at, at the time and was developing uh, in, across work that was published later um, is quite fundamentally opposed to existentialism actually. Um, and that's what I want to put across in this talk, why I think that's the case. So the place to start with that, I think, is his famous novel L'Etranger, which has been translated into English as both the outsider and as the stranger. Both those words are perfectly good um, translations of the French word L'Etranger, but I think the phrase the outsider is probably the better of the two in that it, it better captures um, exactly what Camus wants to do with the novel and, and how he wants us to see Merceau. Because I think it's clear, particularly from the first half of the novel up to the famous incident on the beach, um, that Merceau is, is not simply a stranger to the characters in the novel. He's not simply somebody who's not you know, not well known or, or keeps himself to himself or, or is from somewhere else. He's, he's an outsider in the sense that he's quite different to them. He's quite different in the way he sees the world and in the way he behaves. Not only that, but he's quite different, I think, to us. So I think he comes across as quite strange uh, to, to the reader. Um, his descriptions of scenes and of uh, people's reactions to, to scenes often seem really quite flat and detached and abstract. Um, and uh, when he explains his own behaviour, he gives reasons which seem like 
really quite odd reason sometimes why why you would do that thing um, and and this oddity as sometimes people have described it as a kind of lack of feelings as though he's a he's, he's like a, a kind of robot you know he just sort of sees the world and responds to it and processes it without really engaging with it in any emotional way uh, or any affective way to do with feelings um, but I think that isn't true I think he does display feelings and he describes his feelings and not only that he recognizes other people's emotions he recognizes when they're sad and when they're happy and when they're angry and when they're worried um, and he recognizes that not only because he can see it in their behavior and hear it in their words but also because he recognizes those feelings I think what's odd about him and what gives his descriptions of events and his explanations of his own behavior this this strange flavor is that um, he lacks any emotions that that are genuinely other regarding so what do I mean by that I mean that he doesn't have any feelings or emotions that take other people's interests or other people's happiness as kind of reasons for himself to behave in a certain way or, or reasons for himself to feel in a certain way um, in a nutshell he doesn't really care about the people around him right he doesn't really care about the effect his actions have on them or his words have on them and he doesn't really care how they feel or, or how they um, or whether they get what they want out of life and I think this detachment is quite clear in the way he in the way he talks about the person that he's killed for example or the way he talks about um, the death of his own mother or the way he talks about his girlfriend's uh, reactions uh, to, to their conversations now there's a second feature of him which I think comes is based on that right which is that he can't really empathize with the people around him he can't empathize with the other characters in the novel um, but not only that he can't really empathize with the reader either because he's not just a character in the novel right he's the narrator he's telling the story um, but he's telling it in a, in a in a way which shows that he doesn't really connect uh, he doesn't really get it he doesn't really understand or see how his his audience are going to see what he's saying and that's why he doesn't um, give explanations for his behavior which really kind of satisfy us which really ring true as reasons why you might do the things that he does and and it's also the reason I think why his descriptions of scenes seem so odd he doesn't really pick out the, the features which um, which we assume that he would pick out or that he would respond to or that he would care about it always seems rather abstract and colorless but I think that lack of empathy as I say is a is a, is a symptom of a deeper lack which is that he doesn't have any other regarding emotions that he doesn't he doesn't have what you might describe as a kind of emotional fraternity uh, an, a, 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 an emotional um, connection with the welfare and happiness of the people around him and because he lacks that but we don't right because he lacks that but the people around him in his society don't he can't see the world the same way they see it and he doesn't get it he doesn't understand how they see the world because this is not just an incidental feature of our experience and our life but it's quite a fundamental feature of the way in which we engage with the world I think for Camus so for these reasons um, I think that Merceau is best described as an outsider right rather than simply a stranger he is a kind of existential outsider his form of human existence uh, is unusual to say the least I think Camus thinks that it's human nature whether it's not clear to me whether he thinks that it's a universal feature of human nature or just a very general feature of human nature but I think he thinks it's certainly at least normal for human beings to be emotionally engaged with one another's interests and one another's happiness I think he thinks that this kind of emotional fraternity is a basic feature of human nature and that um, he's presented this novel in order to to dramatize this uh, in two ways so one way uh, uh, in which it dramatizes it I think 
is that um, Merceau is presented as a character who is unlike us in order that we come to recognise the feature of our own lives um, which he is lacking. Okay, so I think what Camus wants to do is draw attention to our own natural emotional fraternity uh, by showing us what life would be like without it, uh, or, or, or what life would be like for an individual who lacked it, and showing us um, that that uh, that individual is an outsider to us, that that, that individual is not um, how most of us are. Um, so what he's doing there is he's uh, rhetorically presenting a kind of case against egoism. Right? So egoism is the view that individuals just pursue their own interests, they just pursue their own happiness, and that's all uh, that motivates anyone. Uh, I think what Camus is up to is showing us what your life would be like if that were true of you, uh, in a way that shows you that it's not what your life actually is like. Right? So he wants us to see that we uh, do in fact care about the interests of other people and the happiness of other people in ways that are not reducible to just caring about our own interests. But there's more to it than that. Um, there's more to it than that because I think Merceau himself makes some progress over the novel. Merceau comes to realise that he's an existential outsider, I think, and I think that's what that's what the the final scene is all about. This kind of revelation um, that that he has. Although he says he's been right all along about something, I think he also discovers that he's been wrong all along about something else, um, and that so he's discovered something new. So throughout the novel, up until the closing sections, um, he has been insisting on a kind of moral nihilism. He's thought that, and insisted that, um, nothing really matters morally, ethically, nothing really matters. Uh, at all. And the reason he thinks that is that he thinks that the universe and life generally lacks any meaning, it lacks any structure, it lacks any objective kind of um, order. Right? And he thinks that for that reason there can't be any moral right and wrong either, because for it to re something really to be right or wrong it would have to be, its wrongness or rightness would have to be grounded in the objective order or meaning or structure of life, and there isn't any. What he comes to see by the end of the novel, I think, is that he's right that the universe and life generally doesn't have any meaning, but he's wrong to think that that uh, shows that nothing matters morally. The reason he's drawn the, the wrong conclusion before is that he hasn't seen that there's another place in which the moral rightness and wrongness of action can be grounded. And that other place is in the emotional lives of individuals. So because he lacks the kind of other regarding emotions, the kind of emotional fraternity that other people have, he can't see that that provides a ground for morality, that that provides a ground for ethics. That Some things are right and others are wrong, some things are good and some things are bad because of our natural emotional fraternity. And that's what he comes to discover by the end of the novel, I think. So I think the second thing Camus is doing with the novel is giving us a kind of um, moral argument. He's giving us a kind of argument to the conclusion that what matters most morally, uh, what's fundamentally important, what grounds uh, right and wrong and good and bad, are our emotional connections with one another. Right? Um, and then that's, as I say, what Meso comes to see as well. Now, these two things, I think, show why Camus is not an existentialist. So as I defined existentialism in the first film, right, um, uh, as Sartre and Beauvoir defined existentialism in 1945, uh, the, the, the key tenet of existentialism is this claim that existence precedes essence. That is, there is no human nature, there's no individual nature, if you want to know why a person behaves the way they do, you, you ultimately it can only be explained in terms of the things that they value, uh, and, and, that, and that the values that somebody has uh, are values that they could change. Right? There's nothing fixed, there's nothing essential about those values. Um, now, 
Camus rejects that, obviously, because he thinks there is such a thing as human nature. He thinks that uh, emotional fraternity is an essential feature, or at least a natural feature, of human existence. So he is not an existentialist in that sense. But it's more than that, because he also grounds his ethics in that claim. Right. I think um, this comes out particularly in his letters to a German friend that he wrote, uh, published anonymously uh, through a, an underground newspaper during the during the Nazi occupation, in which he argued that resistance to, to the Nazis was morally justified, right? Uh, even violent resistance, because um, what it was doing was defending those people that you care most about from uh, the oppression uh, of the Nazis. Whereas, as he later argued in, um, in The Rebel, uh, political violence that's intended to establish a new form of government or a new kind of uh, a new order or a new structure to the world is not justified. It's never justified because that structure is never justified. So he thinks that, and this is how his moral theory kind of plays out as a political theory, um, that because what's right and wrong is ultimately to do with our uh, natural emotional fraternity, um, then political right and wrong has to be grounded that way too. And so uh, violence that's motivated by that kind of fraternity so as a resistance to anything that oppresses or suppresses the interests and happiness of the people we care about, that is justified. Um, but no other kind of violence is. So that's, that's his ethical view, right? That uh, what's right and wrong is grounded in human nature, in um, uh, natural human fraternity. The existentialists, by contrast, think that um, what matters most is the fact that there is no human nature, right? The fundamental moral value that grounds all other ethical and moral value is the fact that human beings just are the kind of creatures that make their own values uh, and make their own lives in that way. And that's what they call authenticity. So that's how fundamentally Camus and the existentialists are opposed to one another. Right? The existentialists think that there's no human nature and that's what's morally most important. Camus thinks there is such a thing as human nature and that's what grounds what's morally most important. They're about as opposed as, as two philosophies could be. Um, and that is why it's certainly very misleading, perhaps, on, on, on uh, about both Camus and the existentialists uh, to classify Camus with Sartre and Beauvoir as an existentialist. Right. Uh, that's it, I think. Thank me very much.